Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. I'm your host, Alan Weil. We're spending the month of April talking about perinatal mental health, which is the focus of the entire April issue of Health Affairs. Now, the mental health of those who give birth is critical to the health and well-being of children. But what about the fathers of those children? Fathers play critical roles that affect child and family well-being, and there's evidence that fathers experience perinatal mood and anxiety disorder with significant consequences for children and families. So how can we include fathers in the discussion as we seek to improve perinatal mental health? That's the topic of today's episode of A Health Podacy. I'm here with Tova Walsh, Associate Professor in the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Walsh, along with Craig Garfield at Northwestern University, published a paper in the April 2024 issue of Health Affairs, summarizing the literature on paternal perinatal mental health and offering a series of recommendations for policies designed to promote the inclusion of fathers in child and family services. We'll discuss the evidence and these recommendations in today's episode. Dr. Walsh, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. So let's start with some of the basics. It may seem obvious, but I never like to think that things are obvious. Why should people who are focused on trying to improve perinatal mental health and address perinatal mental health needs, why should they pay attention to fathers and their mental health and their well-being? So I think there are two reasons that it's really important to pay attention to fathers and their well-being. So first of all, fathers are an important influence on mothers and babies. So when fathers are struggling, they're less able to provide support to mothers. They're less well positioned to bond with their babies. So it's really critical for maternal and child health that we provide the support to fathers that they need. It's also really critical to think about fathers in their own right and recognize that as parents, fathers too are vulnerable to perinatal mental health challenges. And so for fathers' own health and well-being to prevent long-term mental health challenges and consequences for children, it's really key to think about intervening early or even better yet, preventing mental health problems for fathers in the perinatal period. Okay, so there are sort of two different pathways, as you describe, of interest and importance. Now, you noted in the paper, we did a whole issue on perinatal mental health about two and a half years ago. None of the papers were about fathers. When you think about sort of the overall scholarship, the policy focus on perinatal mental health, which we talk a lot about in this issue as we did a few years ago, where do you see fathers included in the conversation? Where do you see them excluded? So I think it's really striking how largely excluded fathers have been from the conversation about perinatal health. But I think it's exciting and promising that there is a growing body of research that makes really clear how prevalent perinatal depression and anxiety are among men and emphasizes what the consequences are for children and families. So uh, the research makes pretty clear that for fathers in the perinatal period compared to men of similar age who are not parents, that they are about twice as likely to be depressed in the period of pregnancy and in the year following the birth of a new baby. And so that's a significantly elevated level of depression, and it's something for us to pay attention to. That body of work has really grown, and so I certainly don't want to say that there isn't scholarship out there. It's out there and it's growing. But it's still the case that overall, when we have kind of a broader societal conversation about perinatal mental health, we're generally thinking about moms. We're thinking about the parent who gave birth. And that is so important that we do that. So I want to be really careful about saying when we call attention to fathers, we're saying alongside mothers, we're saying all parents need to be attended to in the conversation about perinatal mental health. And as I was saying earlier, attending to fathers matters for fathers' mental health, but really is so important to maternal mental health. So for both mothers and fathers, one of the really key factors associated with perinatal depression is the quality of the relationship with your partner. If that's a source of tension, if there are difficulties there, that's a a strain that contributes to depression. So thinking about mothers and fathers, it's really important to think about their role in each other's mental health as well as individually what their mental health needs are. So in the research, we're largely overlooking fathers in the policy realm, which you asked about as well. For the most part, policies that address perinatal mental health are focused on mothers and are not considering fathers. I think we're maybe on the precipice, maybe I'm being optimistic, but really hopeful that we're moving toward a change. We've seen just in the last few weeks, the leadership of the Congressional Dads Caucus and the Black Maternal Health Caucus together jointly wrote a letter to the Secretary of Health and Human Services calling for more research on father's role in the perinatal period. I think there is growing awareness, but 
uh, largely we're not yet paying enough attention to fathers and their role in family well-being in the perinatal period. So that's really interesting. And this question, I don't know if you can answer, but I feel the need to ask it. It sounds like from a sort of evidence base Part of it is how much we know about fathers' mental health, and certainly a lot of the papers we've published on the topic of perinatal mental health get into incidents and rates of different conditions that we should be aware of. But then there's sort of this other part, which is the family dynamics, the mechanics, if you will, of how poor mental health of either or both parents translates into consequences for infants and children. So I'm curious, when you talk about sort of what we do and don't know, are we sort of weak on both of those fronts? I'm not even sure I got the right two fronts, but those are the two that came to my mind. Are we weak on both of those fronts, or are we kind of strong on one and weak on the other? How would you characterize it? Yes. So I would say that the research kind of broadly in mental health on etiology and epidemiology and kind of all the different angles from which we study perinatal mental health, we have a much you know greater depth of knowledge about how mental health plays out for mothers and what its consequences are for families and less so for fathers. I was thinking about prevalence. There are studies that show for fathers, it's, it's generally about 10% of fathers who have depression in the perinatal period. We know significantly less about perinatal anxiety and then even less about other mental health disorders for fathers in the perinatal period. So I think there's kind of a lot to learn there. The research on some of the factors like relationships, we've got you know, some research there, but it's generally with pretty small samples. So one of the striking things is that we've got data on mothers, some data on mothers at the population level. The CDC partners with state health departments on the PRAM survey, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring, <laughs> I hope I got that right, the survey, but the PRAM survey happens around the country. And so we get to have some data that's nationally representative that tells us a bit about how mothers are faring in the period of pregnancy and surrounding the birth of a new baby. Most of the studies that we have with fathers are much smaller, and we can't really generalize from them to understand kind of across the board how fathers are doing. So that's a pretty big gap in knowledge that we don't have a sense broadly about how fathers are doing. Great. That's really helpful. I mean, not great your answer, but that's very helpful that you explain that to me. (laughs) Okay. Well, let's get into some of the recommendations you made in the paper. You structured in the paper your recommendations as sort of local, state, national. I'll follow your lead in doing that. So let's start with some of the local programs. You described some innovative programs that support fathers at the local level. What are they? And particularly, why do you think they're worth highlighting so that maybe they could be expanded and extended to other jurisdictions? So I think one thing I want to say about our recommendations is that we went broad with them. So we're not as... um, You know, we're not just narrowly talking about how we strengthen clinical practice or how we, um, you know, treat depression in fathers. Those are really important questions. But with the set of recommendations that we came up with, we thought kind of more broadly in the realm of support for new parents and thinking about how we meet parents' needs so that they are best equipped and have the resources to meet their children's needs, where are fathers being left out? And so one of the things that we recommended at the local level is that other cities and counties look to the examples of those that have created collaboration to bring together agencies that serve children and families and to think with intention about where fathers are being left out and how that can be corrected. So we gave one example, the Alameda County Fatherhood Corps, which is located in Alameda County, California. They are really kind of a national exemplar, kind of out in front. They've brought together a number of county agencies, social services, health agencies, as well as community-based organizations have come together and they generated a set of principles, the father-friendly principles, and they do training for providers throughout the county to think about where throughout our practice, where when we're creating policy, are we remembering or not remembering fathers and kind of how can we do better? And so they've done a lot of capacity building and this being a countywide effort, it's really just had a broader reach than if one agency has, you know, hires one person to be the fatherhood person. That's kind of in a silo. I think this example is so useful for thinking about how we can really shift the culture in terms of thinking about fatherhood inclusion broadly. So that's really interesting to have. I was thinking, as you said it, you know, we have the sort of the idea of health in all policies. You can sort of imagine a father's in all policies. It does force you to ask questions that you might not otherwise, and it doesn't always answer them, but at least draws attention to them. 
Do you have a sense of what it might take? I appreciated your comment that your recommendations are sort of at a higher level. They're not about clinical practice. But is there something unique about Alameda County, other than that I used to live there, that, you know, it couldn't be replicated? Or is this a model that you think could be spread to other parts of the country? So I think it's absolutely a model that could be spread to other parts of the country. And I think even the the way that Alameda County has created some really useful tools and resources, I see some of those being picked up and used uh, in other locations. But in a perfect world, I would love to see other counties kind of coming together and thinking about in our kind of local context, what are some of the challenges fathers are facing, bringing in fathers who are part of the community to think about what their experiences have been, seeking services, uh, and you know, thinking about where change is needed. And so... You know, I sometimes when I'm I'm talking about this with different audiences, I'm like, there's a whole lot of research about this. But many of us, I think, in our own lives can think of, you know, personal experiences. And I'll just give one example of going to the pediatrician with my husband and our child. And the doctor asks a question about the child and my husband answers and the doctor turns to me just to confirm (laughs) the answer. And that never happens when I offer an answer, right? Like she doesn't look to him to say, is she giving me accurate information about your child? So I I think this is really um, just so prevalent. And so what Alameda County and some other counties have done is such a wonderful example for others to draw from. And the way in which they've brought together so many partners is, I think, you know, something to, to learn from. Well, I want to ask you about some of the state and national recommendations that you made as well. We'll cover those topics after we take a short break. And we're back. I'm speaking with Dr. Tova Walsh about the topic of fathers and how to include them in policy at the local, state, and national level as we're trying to improve perinatal mental health. Before the break, we discussed some innovative models at the local level. I'd like to turn to what you found at the state level. And you referenced that a dozen states have uh, fatherhood commissions. This sounds a little bit like what you just described about the local level, sort of a focal point. But again, you know, what is it beyond the creation of the commission that actually leads to some activity or policy or investigation or exploration or partnership, something that must come out of those that makes you think they're worth doing. Tell me if you could a little bit more about those commissions. Yeah, so there are 12 of these and they go by different names in different states, fatherhood commissions, fatherhood councils, fatherhood committees. But the idea is the same uh, in terms of bringing together diverse stakeholders to be a voice for fathers at the state level to have an influence in policy and also to be a resource for providers throughout the state in terms of helping them locate supports for fathers. So one example would be the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood. And that Commission, you know, just as one example, when the governor of Ohio created a task force on racial disparities in infant mortality, he invited the commissioner to join that task force. And that means that within that task force, there is someone who's reminding us when we're collecting data, when we're trying to make sense of this problem, when we're thinking about solutions, are we thinking about how fathers might be a resource to families? Are we thinking about how fathers relate to this challenge and, you know, kind of where we can include them in our solutions? And so, I think in many states, fathers might be overlooked in that conversation, but having this dedicated entity to focus on fatherhood and giving them a seat at the table in conversations like this one about infant mortality, make sure that there's somebody whose role is to remember fathers and thinking about solutions. That's very interesting. So presumably the focal point would be different from state to state, but I should say the topic where they might focus could be different from state to state. But just again, sort of having a an institutional locus for bringing these things up presumably makes it less likely they'll be overlooked. I think that's exactly right. And then they also play a key role in organizing summits or, you know, provider training series that uh, help to build capacity throughout the state to serve fathers effectively. I want to turn to the national level. I may be distorting your paper a little by focusing my attention on a place that's of particular interest since we're a research journal. You talked about data. We already had a brief conversation about the shortcomings in data around fathers. So if you want to cover a different part of your national recommendation, I would say you're free to do so. But I am curious if there's more you want to say than what you covered earlier about how we would benefit from national attention to better data collection around fathers. And then if you want to bring in something else that you recommended, feel free to do that as well. 
Thank you. Yes. Well, I can definitely say more about the research piece because I, I think it's such a notable gap. So I mentioned the example before of we have data from the PRAM study about mother's well-being in the perinatal period. Um, I want to mention a really exciting pilot that the CDC did in Georgia, led by my co-author on this piece, uh, Craig Garfield at Northwestern. He and colleagues at Northwestern partnered with the CDC to pilot a PRAMS for Dads study and gather data on fathers' experiences and health and behavior and relationships surrounding the period of welcoming a new baby. And the data that they gathered was really striking. So one example, they found that fathers are very involved in putting infants to sleep, but compared to mothers have a lot less knowledge about safe sleep practices for infants. They learned that fathers are involved in feeding and that there are some gaps in knowledge about breastfeeding and ways of being of support to partners. What I want to highlight about that study is that what they learned is really very actionable. If we know that fathers are involved in putting babies to sleep and we know that fathers aren't, you know, that the information that's out there is not really reaching fathers as effectively as it could, then that points towards something that a local department of health, a state department of health might really concentrate on some targeted outreach to dads about safe sleep practices. So I think there would just be so much value in gathering this data on a national level to inform public health strategies to support infant and child well-being. That's really interesting. Can you tie it a little more closely to the perinatal mental health issues? I can certainly imagine that the topics of sleep and food would be sources of family strain or conflict if one parent feels like they have to carry the whole burden because the other can't be trusted or doesn't feel competent. Are there more sort of mental health focused topics that you also see in there? Yes, and, and thank you for the prompt to bring me back to perinatal mental health. I do think that there is a lot that we could learn here. So one thing that I mentioned earlier, we don't really have national data about the prevalence of perinatal mental health challenges for fathers. So just first of all, to get a baseline of truly across the country, how prevalent is depression and anxiety and other mental health challenges for fathers in the perinatal period would be really critical. We know from the research that exists that Postpartum depression, for example, plays out a little bit differently for fathers than for mothers. It has a, a different cycle in terms of uh, tending to emerge a little bit later and, and be more protracted. Fathers tend to express different symptoms, so less likely to report feeling down and sad and depressed mood and more likely to talk about you know, feeling angry or substance use problems, things that are sometimes described as kind of escape or avoid or numbing behaviors in the context of depression. And so having more data on for those fathers who are struggling, what are the symptoms that they are experiencing that could really help to inform how we measure and assess and respond to depression. So one concern is that the existing measures we have for perinatal depression might miss a significant amount of depression in fathers since some of the symptoms that they have aren't what those measures are designed to capture. And if we were able to learn from national data about the symptoms experienced by fathers with depression in the perinatal period, that would help with refining assessment and thinking about treatment and what that might look like for fathers. That's so interesting. It reminds me of heart disease being a leading cause of death and that heart attacks have different symptoms for women than men. And what most people have learned are what men experience for those symptoms. And you can see sort of the reverse situation here where if uh, perinatal depression is viewed through the lens of how women experience that and not men, we could be missing some important information that we could act on. Well, as I think that's a yeah, no, sorry. please go ahead. <laughs> I just was going to say I think that's a perfect analogy because it, it's what we're doing here is kind of you know using the same measures that were developed and you know established around mothers' experience of depression when we then use those measures with fathers. You know, we're missing something in the, in the exact same way that we would be with assessing and treating cardiovascular health and based on research done with fathers or with men. That actually is a, a nice lead into a topic I want to close with. You mentioned at the beginning of the paper, and we it hasn't come up a lot in the conversation, but fathers is a generic term. But in the public view, whether it's through media or stereotyping or other sources, there's a lot of different ways that fathers are portrayed. And there's a lot of difference across race ethnicity, difference across income about how the roles of fathers are portrayed. And it seems important to me to have that in mind so that we're not speaking sort of generically about fathers. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about what some of those cultural and social assumptions are, what role they might play, and how we might uh, undo some of them if they're harmful. 
And so I think that's a really important point. We've been talking about father's mental health in a, a really um, broad way, and, and there is a lot of variation, and there are lots of different factors that play into uh, how fathers view their role. And a big piece of understanding how we can support fathers and father's mental health is kind of understanding the things that shapes their own identity as a father and the support that they might need to be the father that they aspire to be. And so one thing that is really critical to keep in mind is that Fathers have really different experiences from the from the very beginning. Some of my own research focuses on fathers' experiences participating in prenatal care, for example. And so I hear in my work often from fathers, particularly fathers who are minoritized, fathers who identify as Black or African American and who are not married to the mother of their baby, the ways in which they're dismissed by providers and kind of written off. Those fathers face different barriers to access to finding support, to having somebody trustworthy that they could talk to if they are struggling with mental health than a father who's welcomed in and, and treated with respect at those visits. So I think that's a really important thing to consider. Uh, there are you know, variations in the way that fathers present with mental health challenges, and some of that is shaped culturally, ideas about masculinity, um, stigmas that fathers perceive and acknowledging that they're struggling and expressing a need for support. Those are really important things to consider. So there is kind of a lot of heterogeneity here. We talked earlier, too, about the ways in which Family relationships can be a factor in, in perinatal depression, um, so relationships with partner, but also relationships with family of origin can be a source of stress. Financial stress can be really significant in terms of um, something that fathers carry into to fatherhood and experiencing that burden. So there are a lot of differences in terms of the barriers that folks face to accessing care and the ways in which they are received when they uh, show up to healthcare encounters. Well, I appreciate that we end here because it now sort of feeds back into everything we discussed thus far, that if we're going to have commissions or councils or local innovative programs, the inclusion of fathers needs to take into account these cultural issues, these societal assumptions and expectations. And the inclusion of fathers, hopefully, if done uh, well, can actually help break down some of those barriers. And if fathers aren't included, we're probably more likely to, to continue to make the same old assumptions, which it sounds like can be quite harmful. So uh, I appreciate you helping navigate how to overlay that dimension on top of everything else we've discussed. Uh, Dr. Walsh, thank you for uh, conducting this work and writing the paper that we were able to publish in April for talking through the multiple ways that fathers are important if we're going to have a discussion about perinatal mental health. And thank you today for being my guest on A Health Policy. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about A Health Policy.